The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tech Geek webinar series, our endeavor to empower techies. We believe that sharing of knowledge is key to enhance our skills and grow us as a professionals. With this principle in mind, we have initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give you all a crisp insight of various domains. The topic of today's session is Continuous Integration for Databases, the first step with the Redgate SQL Automation Pack. Our guest speaker for today's session is Mr. Tom Austin. He is Delivery Manager at Redgate Software. Tom has spent six years working with Redgate SQL tools, focusing largely on database development and delivery. He has worked closely with customers from many, diff from many different industries to improve efficiency and productivity in their development environments. More recently, he has been assisting Redgate customer with bringing their databases into automated build and CI processes. So without any further delay, I introduce you all to our guest speaker. Over to you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today for, for this session. Um, so but before we get into Redgate SQL Automation Pack, I just want to touch a little bit on exactly what continuous integration is. And um, co continuous integration is a development practice, really, that requires developers to integrate their code regularly so that every time a change is made, it's checked into source control and then that new version of the code is um, tested by way of an automated build. And this allows teams to actually um, detect problems early so that they're not only noticing problems with their code, with the changes that they've made further down the line when perhaps it comes to uh, deployment or when they try and integrate it with other components, other parts of their software. And continuous integration is a, a pretty widely adopted practice in the world of application development. Um, but we haven't seen it become quite so prevalent yet in the world of database development. So what, um, what does CI mean or continuous integration mean for uh, database development? Well, it, it's exactly the same. It's, it's really still that same approach of taking the changes that we make to the database and ensuring by way of an automated build that those are uh, successful changes and haven't broken the, the database. So we're just applying the exact same approach that's commonly used in application development to database development. And we can actually use many of the same um, or similar tools. Um, all that we need to do is extend that with certain components um, which are specialized for database development tasks. So in, in, in my view, the road to database continuous integration really requires four steps. Uh, first of all, we must have our database code in source control. Uh, without having that central repository with all of our code in, it's uh, very, very difficult uh, for us to actually do anything with, with that code. We need it uh, to be in the same central place so that everybody's got access to it and so that we can run these automated builds from a known central point of truth. The second part is really the first steps towards that integration uh, part of continuous integration, and that's automated builds, so that every time changes are made to that central code repository, we pick up on that and run through a predefined process that checks that that latest version of the code can actually be built into, in our case, a database. In uh, um, application world, of course, it would be an application, but we're focusing specifically on the database today. So can we take the latest version of the code files from source control and actually create a database from them? If that's true, we can then move on to uh, step three, which is to run some automated tests. It's one thing being able to create the database from the, the files in source control, but it's another thing to know that that database actually performs the task that it was meant to uh, perform. So here we're talking about things like stored procedures and functions, do they actually still achieve the goals that they were developed and written to achieve? And then finally, we move on to point four, which is the frequent check-in of small changes, uh, which in my view uh, lends itself to the continuous part of continuous integration. 
Once we've got this automated build and test process in place, off the back of having our database in source control, we then want to make sure that we're regularly checking in small changes so that we're testing just tiny increments of um, our, our database development. And this really gives us uh, very quick feedback so that we know um, that one tiny change has been made and we know whether that change has resulted in the database uh, breaking, the, the build being broken and the database no longer either performing what it was intended to do or perhaps even not even being able to be built. Um, or on the other side, knowing that actually that change that we've just made is a good change and the database is still stable and ready. And in theory, you could extend this further and actually move straight on through to deployment as long as your tests and your automated tests and, and builds are uh, uh, thorough enough. So in a previous uh, session, we looked at Redgate SQL source control tool uh, to allow us to put our SQL server databases into our existing source control system very easily, whether that be Subversion, TFS, uh, Mercurial, Git, whatever it is we happen to be using. So we're going we're gonna to check that one off and say that we've already got our database in source control. If you haven't watched that uh, webinar, I'm, I'm sure it's available from the, the website. Um, and that, as I say, we just walk through how we can actually link up our development database to an existing source control repository. Today, I'm going to be working with Subversion as my source control repository, and we're going to be focusing really on the second step of this process, so automating our database builds. Later, we can look at database testing, but for now, for today, I just want to really focus on making sure that actually the latest version of code in the source control repository can actually be created into um, a, a real database. So we touched on these a, a little bit earlier, but there are, there are many advantages of automating a, a build process. First of all, um, of course, once you've automated it, the build is always going to take place in the, in the same way, in the, the same way every single time. So it becomes uh, more reliable and you know that if there's a problem, it's more likely a problem with the code than it is with the actual process of building the database. And through doing this every time we make code changes, we get that very early warning of uh, any broken code so that we're not continuing down a path, uh, continuing development on something that's, that's, that's already uh, not functioning as it, was, as it was meant to. We also, as a result of this process, are able to produce uh, a number of artifacts which can be used in um, processes further up the chain. So we'll see in a little while that we can produce artifacts that can be used by uh, deployment tools or, or perhaps even manual deployments. Um, and also we can store a history of all of the uh, builds that we have and the associated artifacts with each of those builds. And there's many, many more advantages. Um, but I wanted to share with you some of the organizations that we've been working with um, that are already adopting this process of automating their builds, automating their testing, making sure they've always got a release-ready package ready to deploy to their database. So this is a selection of the organizations that I've, I've worked with to implement this over the last uh, couple of years. It, it's really growing in... Um, number at, at the moment. It once, once upon a time, it was very much application development, but now it's really becoming more and more popular in the world of, of database development. So in today's uh, session, we're, we're going to use, as I mentioned at the start, the Redgate SQL Automation Pack and some of the resources within there. We've, um, we've got a, a source control repository that's already got our database code in and we're going to connect that up to a build system. Uh, for today's demonstration, I'm going to be using Team City, but that certainly doesn't mean that you couldn't use any other uh, continuous integration system out there on the market. There are some uh, commercial products, there are some open source products. And what Redgate try and do is provide the components that you plug into these tools uh, so that those tools are then able to handle the database side of things. Well, using the SQL automation pack, we're going to perform a couple of tasks. We're first of all going to verify that we can build our database successfully from the code files in source control. But then we're also going to take it a step further and add a step that's going to verify that we can upgrade 
an existing database to the new version uh, that's, in, that's in source control. We're also going to make sure that this triggers automatically. As I mentioned on a previous slide, it's really important that we automate this process so that we're continually getting the feedback on the, uh, the quality of our code, whether it's whether it's good to go or whether we actually need to revisit it and fix any problems that we may have introduced. And we're going to introduce this idea of artifacts that are being produced as a, as a result of this process that we can use in the future for, for repeatable deployments. So the particular component of the SQL automation pack that I'm going to be using today is our SQL CI plugin for Team City. Um, as the name suggests, we once installed it, adds itself into the Team City environment and allows us to very easily configure database CI. It includes uh, four different uh, tasks, build, test, sync, and publish. Um, and if you're not using Team City, there are a number of other resources that you can use within the SQL automation pack to achieve similar. Uh, so I'll just bring up the SQL automation pack dialog box quickly so that you can see some of the options. Um, Team City is the, was the first one that Redgate produced resources for, but on top of that we now offer resources so that you can work with uh, TFS, uh, with Jenkins, with pr pretty much any uh, continuous integration system out there. Um, in its most simple form, we have a command line tool that you can just call from your uh, CI system. I chose Team City because it is very integrated, it very, is very clear how the sets are actually created, and it's a nice, easy starting point for anybody who wants to um, take their first steps towards uh, continuous integration for databases. So we are um, about to look at a couple of steps from the four that are available to us. Um, specifically the build and sync steps. Now, as the name suggests, the build step is going to be used for actually checking that we can create this database from scratch, from the, the files. And then the sync step is the step that we're going to use to make sure that we can upgrade an existing database to the new version that's in source control. So this is the, the process that we're kind of modeling here. Uh, developers make their changes to their databases, which are committed via SQL source control to their source control repository. And then automatically, once those changes are picked up, we will see that they are uh, built by the Team City build step, and then the sync step will run to upgrade an existing database to that new version. The current setup that I'm using, uh, I'm using Subversion as my source control system. I'm working with SQL Server 2012. Uh, we, as I mentioned right at the beginning, we've used Redgate SQL source control to put our database into our Subversion repository, and we're using uh, Team City as our continuous integration system. And of course, the Redgate Team City plugin has been installed from the Redgate SQL automation pack. So the first step that I want to look at is the build step. And this goes through a process um, that is, is very much hidden from the user because, because it is in the form of a plugin that we just specify some parameters um, and then run. Much of the hard work is actually hidden in the background. But I wanted to talk you through exactly what's going on so that when we see it in a moment, we understand the process that it's going through. So with the build step, the first thing that, that happens is we take the scripts from the source control repository and wrap those up into a NuGet package. Um, and the NuGet package is uh, it's, uh, like a zip file with metadata attached to it. So it's got versioning information, author information. But essentially, it's just bundling all of those uh, scripts from source control up into a single package file. Once we've done that, we then use those files to um, compare the scripts from source control to a blank database that we create specifically for this task. What that does is generate a create script, 
which we're then able to run against our target blank database, which in theory should create the um, actual database representation of the database that's stored in the source control location. And finally, if that database that we've created matches the format that's described in the script files in source control, then we can confirm that actually we were able to build this database from those files. The output of this step is then the database package that we created, which has, of course, a fixed set of uh, uh, database source control scripts representing each of the objects um, from our database. So really, the, the, the process that we're looking at here is create a blank database, grab the latest version of the files from source control, compare those to that blank database to generate a creation script, run the creation script against the target, and then compare that database to the version of the database that the script files represent. If they match, then we've successfully been able to create the database. And then we output the database package that can be used later on. So let's, uh, let's take a look at how we'd actually implement that uh, using the Redgate Resources and Team City. So let me just go into my remote desktop here. Um, as I mentioned, I have Redgate SQL Source Control installed, and I've used SQL Source Control to add this particular database, SQL Server Central Dev, to uh, a source control repository. So we can see that here. Here's my uh, subversion repository, and it's in a, a subfolder, SQL Server Central database scripts. And then in each of these five folders, we have our latest version of our uh, object SQL creation scripts. I've also got Team City running, and just a, a couple of steps that I have already set up. Um, so if we go into the settings of this particular project, I've created a project called Database CI, and in the version control settings, I've pointed this at my subversion repository. So that same repository that we just saw uh, SQL source control being used to add our database files to subversion, that's the repository that this particular project is, is running off of. And that's everything that I've done already. So I've created a project, pointed it to my subversion location. I haven't actually added any of the, uh, the functionality. We have installed the Team City plugin, and so we can now proceed to add a build step to this particular project to make use of the Redgate resources. So if I go to the build steps, at the moment we have none. I'm going to add a build step. And then from the drop-down list, I'm going to choose one of the newly installed Redgate options. In this case, Redgate SQL CI build. I'm going to give it a name, database build. My source control files are in my root, so where, where I specified the location of my source control files in the version control settings here. And I don't have to specify a further subfolder. They are in that location. I'm going to give this a, a, a package ID. So first steps DD. And this is going to be the name of the package that's produced at the end of this build process. And then lastly, I need to specify a server that can be used to temporarily create this database as we go through that process of creating the blank database, comparing it to the source control version, uh, generating the create script, and so on. So I'm just going to use my local uh, SQL Server instance. And then I'll finally save this. So only a few parameters that we are required to provide here, um, a server for it to work with, and then the name of the package that we want it to output at the end of this process. And that's, that's really all we need to do for the build step. If we look now in our, if we go back to the project page and actually run this process, what we'll see is that it will now go through that 
um, set of tasks, so it will check out the files and source control. Then it will use the RedGet continuous integration resources, so the SQL automation pack, to start running through that process that we described of um, creating the blank database, which you can see here, creating the scratch database, and then comparing that scratch database to the latest version of the files, which we can see here, and then running that create script against the target database before finally checking that, uh, that, that everything matched up. Um, and that finished really rather quickly. That, that, it didn't take long at all. And what we can actually see if we go back to the projects page here is as a result of that, it's actually produced an artifact, which is our first step DB uh, NuGet package that I mentioned. And if we open that up, here we can see inside that we've got all of our SQL scripts uh, for our various different database objects, our tables, our stored procedures, etc. So this is great. So we've, we've set up our build step. Our build step is working. The um, next thing that we want to do is actually trigger this automatically. So I'm going to go back into the project settings. I'm going to go into triggers. I'm going to add a new trigger, and this is going to be a VCS trigger, a version control um, trigger, so that every time there's a check-in detected, we'll run through this build process. So let's check that that works. I can do this by making a change to the database. Uh, let's change one of the stored procedures, for example. Uh, maybe take out some of these columns. And then using Red Gate SQL Source Control, commit this change to our Source Control repository. And then if we switch back over into our Team City Projects Overview, in just a moment, we should see, there we go, it's picked up on the fact that a change has been made and it will start running through the process of actually building, um, running through those build steps uh, to build the database in the, in the way that we described. So it, it's not, um, not much really for us to do. Um, the, the integration uh, into Team City with the, the plugin means that all we need to do is provide a few, few parameters and the rest of the hard work is actually taken care of for us by the, uh, the Redgate resources. So, if we go back to our slides, the next uh, step is, is possibly one of the, um, uh, the more interesting steps if we do have an existing database that we're, we're looking to upgrade. Um, as a result of the first step, we produced a database update package. Um, that database NuGet package that was the, the output artifact. And what we can now do is use these in, um, in, in coming steps to actually perform a, a, a load more tasks. In this particular step, what we're looking at is using that database package as a source version to uh, dynamically update an existing database to the new version uh, from source control. So what happens in this particular step is we receive the, uh, the NuGet package, the database package that was produced by the build step. We then compare that to a, an existing target database to generate an upgrade script. We run the upgrade script against that target database. And then finally, we do a comparison between the target database and that package to see whether they, uh, they now match up. So very similar to what we did in the build step, but this time, instead of creating a temporary database and throwing it away at the end, uh, what we're actually doing is continually updating an existing database so that we're always, um, always up to date with the latest version in source control. And of course, in this uh, step, what we can do optionally is capture that upgrade script, capture the upgrade script that is used to actually upgrade that target database. So let's see how 
uh, how, how we make this happen. So I'm going to go back into my project and the important thing for me to remember this time is when I go into edit settings and to the build steps, the most important thing I'm going to need is the name of the package that I want to use. So this is the, uh, the output package ID that I uh, added in the build step, first step DB. I'm going to choose to add another build step and this time select regex SQL CI sync. I'm going to say update existing database. And I'm going to add my package ID first step DB. Now this time, instead of providing a temporary uh, server, a, a server where we can create that temporary database, I need to specify my target database that I want to be upgraded. So I'm going to add the server name and then the database that I'm going to use for this process is this SQL Server Central underscore CI. So I add the database name. SQL Server Central underscore CI. And then hit save. And so now we've got one build step which produces a, a package called First Steps DB. And then a sync step which uses that uh, package. Oh, I've just noticed I've missed the, uh, uh, the second S there. So let me just correct that. So steps DB. Um, and then uh, the sync step which uses that created package to upgrade our target database, in this case, SQL Server Central underscore CI. So let's go into Management Studio. Um, I'm just going to show that at the moment I have just these three stored procedures in SQL Server Central CI. And what we're going to do is add a new stored procedure to our SQL Server Central Dev database. And I'm just going to add something in the body of this stored procedure. Uh, using Team City. Like it, just as an example so that we can see uh, the change that we've made. I'm going to execute that and as before, right click and commit to source control. So we've got our new stored procedure. Hit the commit button, and then if we switch back over into Team City, we'll see that the, it picks up on that pending build. And this time, when it launches, it will actually do both steps for us. So it will start by doing the build step to produce that package, and then on completion of that step, it will proceed on to use that package to update our uh, target environment uh, with that new version. So here we can see step one of two has finished, and then it moves on to step two of two, and we're now updating that target database uh, based upon the package that we produced in the in the previous step. Okay, so the one thing that we haven't uh, done yet is to actually um, capture any upgrade script. Um, and so to do this, uh, we just simply add an additional parameter on the end of our uh, build step, so the sync step. So at the bottom here, you see we've got this area for additional parameters. And I can use the switch slash script file and then give it a path. Uh, to somewhere to store that script file. So in this case, I'm going to use a, a folder on my D drive, the update script, and paste that in there. Save this step. 
And now, if I change uh, something about uh, this particular store procedure, and commit that to source control. What we'll then see is again that build automatically running because it will pick up on the fact that we've made a change and this will actually this time as part of the process produce that upgrade script and save it into our um, folder on our, on our D drive here. Um, now I haven't um, I haven't done much really here. I haven't done much. So I've, I've just specified a location. Um, but what I, what I really need to do is specify a name for this file. And what we could do, do is use some of the build parameters within Team City so that we actually number our upgrade scripts as they're produced. So we could pick up on the build number here, number nine, and um, export this uh, update script so that it says you know, this is build number nine. Um, and the way we do that is, is, is really just amending this um, build step additional parameter. Uh, so we come in here and, you know, we'd extend this to say update script. Um, and then add the, uh, the placeholder for the build number uh, .sql. Um, and then as it, as it completes its build process, it will actually um, generate that script, save it in the folder, picking up on the build number that we've, uh, we've used. Um, now, depending on which continuous integration system you use, there's going to be a different format for picking up on the build number. Um, in many, it's something along the lines of percent time build dot number percent or percent time build underscore number percent. Um, but if you look in the documentation of your particular CI system, uh, you'll be able to find uh, that, that uh, variable pretty, pretty easily. Um, so we'll just wait for this uh, step to complete and open up our folder. And we can see there's our up, up, update.sql script that was produced as a result of this process running. So that really is um, how easy it, it can be to actually set up database continuous integration using the uh, Redgate resources. Um, we've seen there how once we have our development databases linked to a source control location using SQL source control, um, we can very easily add the Redgate SQL automation pack resources to our continuous integration, our chosen continuous integration system. In, in this case, we use Team City, um, and with a, just a couple of steps, with a few parameters, we've been able to uh, build the database upon each commit to source control, producing a database package, and then actually extend that further by then applying that update to an existing database and producing an, an, an upgrade script um, that we can capture. If we wanted to, we can also number those upgrade scripts so that we can store them off somewhere um, in case they should be needed uh, in the future. So thank you uh, very much for, for watching the uh, presentation today. Um, I hope that you'll go away and try some of the SQL automation pack resources um, now that you can see how easy it is to actually configure continuous integration to your database. Um, and at this point, I'm, I'm very happy to open it up to any questions that anybody has. Thanks, Tom, uh, for such an insightful presentation on continuous integration for databases. Let us quickly take up questions now. I request you to please read out, read out question before answering them so that all our users may listen to the commendable insight. Of course. So I'm so please go to the question panel. There you can see questions. Okay, yeah, just get into it now. Um, okay. When you um, 
So the first question, when you said database code should be in source control, do you mean stored procedure or even the database table creation? Um, so my view on this is that actually we should put all of our database code in source control. It's, um, it's certainly possible that you could filter this down so that you're only source controlling your stored, uh, stored procedures or your functions. Um, but with tools available like Red Gate SQL Source Control, it's really very easy to, to put your entire database in source control. Uh, so if the latter is true, how do you create client-specific fields? Um, so there's a number of different approaches to, to this. Um, there's actually a blog post on um, the future of deployment website that goes into this in, in quite a bit of detail. Um, it's certainly possible. Um, the tools that we provide have filtering options so that you can uh, filter based upon the objects that are in source control and also filter your deployments so that when you're creating your deployment scripts, you're only picking up on the objects or uh, columns or fields that are, are specific to um, your target user, your target customer. Um, so in that case, I'd, I'd encourage you to take a look at the uh, future of deployment blog post. Uh, which the specific one that will be relevant to this question is, uh, let me just find it here, one second. So it's, it's called customer specific database deployment. There we go. Customer specific database deployment. Um, so if you take a specific blog post, I think that will um, that will answer a lot of the questions. It's probably a little bit too much depth for us to go into in the uh, the session today. But thanks thanks for the question. Good question. Uh, so moving on. Um, is it possible to source control the database code if the application uses multiple databases? Yes, it certainly is. All you need is a, a subfolder in your source control repository for each individual database. Um, so that's, that, that's certainly no, no problem at all. And the next question, is the source control only for the scripts or for the data as well? If we have to create a new column in the existing script and also need to populate data, how should this be done? Can this be done via source control or do we need to update data separately? Um, so a, a lot of these questions are, are, are I guess, focused in around um, source control, which it is the, the product that uh, SQL source control product that we covered in the previous webinar we did. Um, so definitely I'd, I'd recommend taking a look at that. I will show you quickly, though, a couple of things. So when you are um, when you link your database to source control using Redgate SQL source control, we have some other options under the other SQL source control tasks right-click menu. And one of those is link or unlink static data. Um, and this enables us to define which of our tables we want to source control the data from, as well as, well as the structure. Um, and this is, this is brilliant if it's uh, reference data, any lookup values, that kind of thing. Um, however, if it's not that kind of data that you want to source control, and what you want to do is accompany a schema change with a, a data change, so maybe uh, something like adding a not null column, column, so you want to add um, some data as part of that process. Um, we actually provide the ability to add migration scripts to your check-in. So you make a schema change, um, and then you can hit the Add Migration Script button. But so that, uh, alongside that change that you're uh, adding to source control, you can also add some uh, specific uh, SQL code of how to handle that change uh, further down the line. Um, OK, so next question is, Uh, is um, is source control only for the script to the data as well? I think that's the one we just did. Um, which rights will be required to run 
the SQL and Team City. Um, so this is this is configurable. Um, for, for Team City uh, or any chosen um, continuous integration system, I'd, I'd suggest you check their documentation. Um, what, uh, what I'm not here uh, really to, um, to, to, to talk about is Team City. Um, I just happen to use this as one of the continuous integration systems that are available. What my company, Redgate, provides are the uh, resources that plug into your um, continuous integration system to allow you to achieve database continuous integration. Um, of course, for the build step, you're going to need um, a server where you have rights to create a database, um, but this doesn't need to be a, a production server, certainly not. This could be a, a local instance of SQL Server that you've got specifically um, installed just, just to deal with the um, the continuous integration process. Um, so certainly, it, it doesn't it doesn't need to interfere with your standard environments that you're um, that you're working with, because in essence, we're actually just throwing away uh, the database in the build step at the end. So it's only a very short space of time that it's actually being used. Uh, we then have another question on. Uh, do we have something similar for MySQL as well? Um, so at this point in time, uh, Redgate's primary focus is around Microsoft SQL Server databases. Um, we reasonably recently added some resources and some products that allow you to achieve similar with uh, Oracle databases. But uh, unfortunately, MySQL databases we, we haven't uh, we haven't tackled just yet. Um, it's likely that for the near future we'll, we'll continue to focus on uh, Microsoft SQL Server and um, Oracle. Uh, is the plugin only available for SQL? Any plans to support open source databases? Um, so again, at the, at the moment our focus is very much on Microsoft SQL Server databases um, with some, some tools targeting the Oracle database platform. Um, in the future, it's quite possible that we will expand that scope and, and look towards um, things like MySQL and, and other database platforms. But right now, really, the focus is uh, Microsoft SQL Server and, and Oracle databases. So I think... That's answered all of the questions that we've had so far. Is there any any other last questions coming in? So this is all uh, what we have got from our participants. Uh, I request all our participants, if they have any question in their mind or something related with the topic, please ask to Tom. He will answer his. He will answer all the questions. Tom, we have a lot of time, uh, so you want us to wait for some. For some more time? Sure, I'm very happy to wait. All right. Um, so, so we had a, another question, uh, what is the cost of Team City? Um, I, I'm, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of that. Um, I, I, I don't work for JetBrains, the producers of, of Team City. Um, the resources that Redgate provides are really are, are part of the um, SQL automation pack, which fits into any continuous integration system. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, Team, uh, Team City. Um, the whole entire package of, of products, uh, of components that we sell for purposes of continuous integration um, is a, approximately $5,000 um, and that, as I say, provides all of the components for setting up CI. Um, but as far as costs of continuous integration systems, I, I'm sorry, I'm not, not aware of that. Um, but I'm, I'm sure uh, there are 
open source alternative. So I know, for example, Jenkins is a is a, an open source CI system, and we work just as well with that as we do any other CI system. Um, so we've had another question: What is the cost of Redgate's uh, source control tool? Um, so Redgate's SQL source control tool costs uh, approximately three hundred dollars. Three hundred. Is it possible to integrate with Microsoft SourceSafe? Um, so I, I think this is uh, specifically talking about our source control tools, Red Tech SQL Source Control. Um, unfortunately, we don't offer support for Microsoft um, Visual SourceSafe, um, and that's really due purely down to the fact that Microsoft have, of course, officially ended life the product. Um, however, the replacement TFS, Team Foundation Server, that Microsoft are encouraging everybody to move to, yeah, certainly there's, there's support for that in Redgate SQL Source Control Tool. If we're already using Team Viewer, why should we migrate to Team City? Um, I, I'm certainly not trying to suggest that you do uh, migrate to, to Team City. Um, the resources that my company produces, that Redgate pro produces, are add-ins that will, can um, be plugged into any continuous integration system. So again, whether you're using uh, Bamboo, Jenkins, Hudson, Team City, TFS Build, um, Cruise Control, what, whatever uh, automation tool you want to use, um, the components that we provide within the SQL Automation Pack can be added to that. Um, I simply chose Team City as it's a, it, it's a, it's a nice, easy one to look at. Um, there's certainly no, no reason why you can't use any other continuous integration system. Um, I'm actually not familiar with Team Viewer. Uh, I haven't used that one before, but um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that if it, if, it, if it allows you to execute something from the command line, if you can make a command line call to um, a, uh, an executable, then you can use the, the Red Dead resources. I think, uh, Tom, we are done with the question and answer round. Okay. Okay. So I am very thankful to you for taking so many questions or even all the questions and conducting this webinar. It was indeed thank a great. It was indeed a great session. I would also like to thank all our participants for their support in making this webinar a success. The recording of this webinar will be available on our website, that is techgeek.com, by tomorrow. So if you have any question or some or any query, you can come to you can come to our website, that is techgeek.com. You can post the, your question there, and I will request Tom also. Please visit uh, after some day, and if you find any question related to the topic, please answer them. Certainly. Yeah. So, so have a nice day to all of you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.